Good evening, everybody. How are you? Good? How's the week going? Not tired yet? <laughs> Great. So it's, uh, it's our second uh, Dean Speaker Series uh, speaker. Okay? We go from finance to artificial intelligence. Okay? Um, so Lucas Joppa is our speaker for the day. He's uh, most welcome here. I'm glad he accepted the invitation. He's, uh, he's here in Lisbon because of the Web Summit, so he just came from the Web Summit. He's actually considered by Expresso, which you may know as the main newspaper in Portugal this weekend, one of the top 10 speakers of the Web Summit, so it's a real pro pleasure to have him with us here at Catolica. Um, so Lucas began his uh, career at Microsoft uh, Research. Um, already in research programs at the intersection of environment and computer science. And then he moved on to, to lead the program called AI for Earth, okay, which was a five-year, uh, five $50 million uh, program to deploy basically Microsoft experience in artificial intelligence to four key areas of, uh, of, the, of the environment, so agriculture, water, biodiversity, and climate change. Now he was, uh, he was entitled as the first chief environmental officer at Microsoft and managing basically the company's overall sustainability uh, efforts. Um, now, this is basically one, one very interesting area because he's going to talk to us about the environment and human impact and computer science. So how basically we deal with natural resources, artificial intelligence, uh, what does it mean for the data that exists around us, and how can we translate artificial intelligence into actionable actions that we can take on a daily basis uh, and communicate them better? Ultimately, it's all about something that we've been telling you all along, how to combine human, with, uh, human intelligence with artificial intelligence. This is the world you will live in forever, and this is a great example of that. Um, Lucas uh, originally has a bachelor in wildlife ecology and zoology, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and then he has a PhD in ecology from Duke University, uh, and a former Peace Corp volunteer in Malawi. That's mm -hmm. something very interesting as well. Yeah. So, Lucas, thank you very much for being with us. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much. I'm gonna steal this thing. <laughs> you might want to wait to clap before I'm, till I'm finished. Um, see if it was worth it or not. Uh, and I should also say that newspaper, might, after I gave my talks today, they might want to go back and reassess if I'm in the top 10 speakers at the Web Summit. Um, I would say if you haven't been to the Web Summit, uh, I don't work for them, but you should go. Uh, it's, it's, it's a fantastic thing to see. Um, I'd never been, and I spent the day there today giving a bunch of talks and meeting a bunch of folks, and it's just this incredible diversity of startups and investors and kind of big thinkers from all around the world. Uh, coming together and, and really talking about kind of the current issues of today. I think it's a fantastic opportunity for, for Lisbon, uh, for Portugal more broadly, but Lisbon in particular to really engage with that global technology community. Um, and so take advantage of it. I just heard that uh, Lisbon signed on for another 10 years. So that's something that uh, no matter where you are in your studies or career in Lisbon, as long as you don't look to emigrate, you can go to Web Summit uh, for a long time moving forward. Um, so I'm going to try and keep this fairly short, maybe 15 minutes, um, and then I guess we'll go into Q&A and you guys can ask me all the hard questions I didn't get around to answering uh, in my talk. So I am the first chief environmental officer for, for Microsoft. Um, I come from the environmental side, but I've dedicated my entire career uh, to, the to the applications of technology to environmental science and solving some of our environmental challenges of today. And that really um, is, you know, it, so I guess in some ways, just like a Surface device or anything else, I'm a product of Microsoft. I just, I went there straight out of school and I've stayed. Um, and, and so what I learned as soon as I joined the company was that we care about these big societal issues. We care about global environmental sustainability challenges. We care about them all up, but we really focus our efforts on action on thinking about these issues through the lens of our core corporate competencies, which are technology, engineering, and innovation. We're not here to say that technology is going to solve all of our problems. We're here to say that technology is what we do really well and that we think that there's a place for us to help, right? So that's really the context of, of the way that we think about sustainability in the company. And that made me feel kind of cool, by the way, to like do a behind the shoulder. Uh, uh, anyway, um, 
so and the way that we think about Microsoft all up is at a very kind of has an existential kind of philosophy to it, I guess, because we see ourselves doing business at the intersection of two unprecedented ages. Right? And the first is the information age. I'm sure you all speak about the information age quite frequently. You all use the tools and technologies of the information age every day. It's really defined by this ubiquitous presence of computing in our day-to-day -day lives. Uh, and Microsoft helped build the foundations of it, the architecture and the building blocks of the information age. But we also operate at a time of almost unprecedented societal challenges. I'm an environmental scientist, so I happen to be a little bit biased, which scientists aren't supposed to be, but there you have it. That the environmental side of our societal challenges are some of our most existential, and that, um, and that history ultimately is gonna judge the success of companies like Microsoft, not by the number of years we were in the top five global companies by market capitalization, not by uh, you know, the ultimate amount of profit that we generated for our shareholders, even though that's what we're being judged on day to day, right? Ultimately, history is going to judge us on how we successfully or unsuccessfully deploy our technologies to solve some of society's biggest challenges, right? Um, and so I work on that every day as the, as the chief environmental officer for the company. And I wake up and I know I basically have a pretty simple job. It's at least a really simple job to say. It turns out that then you go to work and things get really complicated. Um, but the simplicity of which you can say it is just that my job is to do everything possible to drive down the negative environmental impacts of our business operations while driving up the positive environmental impacts of our products, our, our policies, and our partnerships with customers and, and collaborators all around the world. Because, and we focus on, on our efforts on these four or five areas of carbon, energy, water, waste, and, and ecosystems, and biodiversity more broadly. But the reason that we think about this, and the reason that we're increasingly putting more and more focus on this side of the equation, on driving up the positive impacts of these things outside of our own four walls, is because of the realization that no matter how sustainable Microsoft is as a company, if we're 100%, choose whatever definitions of sustainability you want, say we maximize those and we have no impact on anybody else outside of our four walls, that's not a success for our company and it's not a success for society. So what we have to do is ensure that we do everything possible to be as sustainable as possible and we in so doing empower everybody else around the planet to follow our lead, and that we listen to everybody else and we follow their lead when they're showing significant progress. And so there's lots of different things that Microsoft does on, on uh, let's see if I can master this thing, on this side of the equation. So for instance, we've been operating as a carbon neutral company since 2012. We're the first large corporation and one of the only still, re still today to have put an actual price on carbon that we charge every business unit. This isn't a shadow price for planning that you hear about talking, people talking about. This is actually the chief financial officer flowing this down across the entire company as a fee that then goes into a fund, that then we use that fund to procure renewable energy, to offset our emissions from things like plane travel, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and off the back of that, we have renewable energy goals and carbon emissions reductions, like a commitment that we have to reduce our emissions by 75% by 2030 uh, relative to a 2013 baseline. But the thing that I really want to talk about today, because we're supposed to be talking about kind of the defining issues of our time and artificial intelligence, is really what we're doing and where a lot of our focus is on this side here, and particularly here around the deployment of our products um, for one simple purpose, to change the way that society monitors, models, and ultimately manages Earth's natural resources. Because remember I was talking about the information age. Well, what they very rarely mention in the media or in your classes about the information age is that that is one of the most narcissistic things that we've ever done, calling it the information age, when in fact all it is is information about ourselves where our friends are, what our family's doing, where the nearest Starbucks, where the nearest 20 Starbucks are, 
around us. It's information about ourselves. Wildly important and impressive what we've done, but we've done so at the expense of ignoring the vast majority of life on Earth and the processes that that life uh, supports and the benefits to human society that that life provides. And so we launched about a year ago, uh, the president of Microsoft, a guy named Brad Smith, um, at the one year anniversary of the Paris Climate Agreement um, in, in Paris last December, launched a new program on behalf of the company called AI for Earth. It's a $50 million five year commitment to deploying Microsoft's AI technologies in the four, oh, sorry, I'll go over here, in the four key areas of agriculture, water, biodiversity, and climate change. Uh, it's a recognition that we as a society somehow have to figure out how to mitigate and adapt to changing climates, ensure resilient water supplies, sustainably feed a human population rapidly growing to 10 billion people. Think about that for a second. Go back and look at the UN population curve that you can find on a gazillion different websites. Find your date of birth and ask how much population has risen since the day you were born. When I go and do that for myself, it's almost doubled in my time on Earth. Okay, And we've got to do the, all of that while somehow stemming a global and catastrophic loss of biodiversity. Uh, Living Planet Report came out. Raise your hand if you saw the Living Planet Report in the news. Well, two things have to happen. The news has to cover it better, and you guys need to read a bit more. So, uh, but what that Living Planet Report said is that in two human generations, we have wiped out over 60% of animal life on Earth. Two generations, your parents and you, my parents and me, right? So, and we've got to do all of this stuff together. And what that means, ultimately, you've got a growth curve, and somehow you need a reduction curve. The only way you get there is through transformational changes in efficiency, resource use efficiency. How do we grow more food on less land with less impact? How do we use less water more efficiently? How do we um, remove as much uh, greenhouse gas emissions from the atmosphere once they're there while minimizing the amount that we put in there? And I'm convinced that technology and the traditional technology play that the sector has put together is going to play a transformational role in that through the digitization of the entire natural resource sector, allowing us to track model to monitor model and manage all of these systems and we're going to do that by following this simple formula this is the simple formula that microsoft and google and amazon everybody any major cloud provider i guess of which there's only a few has put together we've compiled unprecedented scale of computing infrastructure we've s support massive new data sets on top of that infrastructure we confront those data with algorithms. And through that confrontational process, we train these machines to do more intelligent things. We take that intelligence and we make it available to the world through scalable web services in the form of application programming interfaces or APIs, which is the communication channels, the translational service for the information age. And then we consume those APIs into end user specific applications that help people be more efficient with what they do. That's how your phones work, that's how your computers work, that's how everything works. That's what we need, that's how we need things to work in the natural resources sector. And so, and so the AI for Earth program is intended in the first five years to work on kind of the first parts of the problem. And the first parts of the problem are that we often ask, and this is one of the great ironies of our age, we often ask those with the least to do the most. We ask the philanthropically based nonprofits to solve climate change. We ask the chronically underfunded government agencies, environmental government agencies, let's be clear, not all government agencies are, are chronically underfunded, um, to do on behalf of society, what all of society is going to struggle to do altogether. And so we say, hey, you know what? Funding or budget should not be a barrier to accessing the latest artificial intelligence technologies. We have a simple grant making process that makes it as easy as possible for anyone who wants to take a machine learning first approach to, um, to environmental solutions. 
to get access to our, to our technologies for free, then we admit that access doesn't necessarily solve your problem because access to technology that you don't know how to use doesn't really get you that far. And so we have a lot of online and in-person education programs to get people upskilled on how to use our stuff. And then we lean in and we co-develop, co-engineer together with external organizations on a few specific applications that we think have the potential to fundamentally change uh, the way that we monitor natural resources. And so what I want to talk about is just one example of kind of everything that I've been talking about, and then we'll go into question and answer period. And so this project that I want to talk about is all about mapping land cover, which sounds kind of boring, right? But ultimately, land cover, understanding where your forests and your fields, your water and your built infrastructure, understanding where it is, how much of it is there, and how fast is it's changing, is like a first order principle to being able to make any intelligent environmental management decisions. And in the United States, which is one of the most technologically advanced countries on Earth, the last time we went through a process like this at a national scale was eight years ago. I didn't have any kids eight years ago, and so it seems like an entire lifetime ago. And I can also tell you that in that eight years, we have fundamentally transformed entire landscapes, entire regions across our country. And so we worked to say, hey, let's get some of our tools in the hands of this small little 19-person nonprofit that cared deeply about one little region in the United States, the Chesapeake Bay watershed on the northeast coast of the US. And let's help them produce a map of that region that's updated and that's at an appropriate level of spatial resolution, one meter resolution that lets you see down and say, there's a tree, there's a car, et cetera, et cetera. So we provided them access to our technology and it took them 18 months and over a million dollars to create this one map across about 100,000 square miles um, of the United States. The problem was is that if it takes you 18 months, that means that you're already out of date by the time you get done. And you can see this cycle. You're getting further and further behind yourself. And so what we said was, surely there must be a way to make this more complicated. That's basically the answer that anybody who studies machine learning will say, surely there's a way we can do this. And by that, they mean we're just going to take a simple problem, make it super complicated, and we might solve it. Um, so beware of the machine learning guys in, in your midst. Um, and so this slide is really just to prove to you that we can make it complicated. Um, what we did was we took that map that that organization had made for that region, and we used it as training data, as labeled training data for a deep neural network, a convolutional deep neural network, uh, if you really care about it. And if you really care about it, it's a UNET model, uh, which instantiates that network with 23 layers. And for those of you who took statistics, who's a statistician? Took statistics. Let's, let's back it down. I, no one wants to admit to being a statistician, right? Uh, I wouldn't even do that. Um, you realize, you know, one of the things that statistics is always pursuing is parsimony, right? You want to have the most predictive model with the least number of unexplainable parameters. Well, machine learning just gave up on parsimony when it started, right? This is why there's statistics and machine learning. Statisticians believe in parsimony, machine learning people don't. Uh, and this is an example why. Our model has almost, uh, well, almost 315,000 parameters, right? Uh, so it becomes very difficult to understand what this thing is doing. All you can understand is what it, at what it outputs at the end. And what we managed to do is we managed to train this thing up and build a model that can go from 18 months to much more rapidly ingesting satellite imagery and outputting labeled data about where your forests and, and your fields are. Um, and if you run that in the cloud, you can spin up a lot of machines, and you can just make that faster and faster and faster. As many machines as you want to spin up, you can just drive the, the time to completion down. And so then what we said was, hey, we want to do this. That was fast, and that was cool, but we want to do it even faster. So we took advantage of a new project, a new uh, service that was announced on, um, on Microsoft's cloud on Azure called Project Brainwave. And what Project Brainwave does is it takes advantage of a new kind of silicon architecture called FPGAs. Does anyone know what FPGA stands for? Nobody? Anyone want to guess? 
field programmable gate arrays, which my kids always ask me to say as many times, like Mary picked a pop up, blah, 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 because uh, I can't say field programmable gate arrays. I can barely say it once. Uh, but what it is is if you think about the way that computing architecture is gone, you've got your CPUs, right, which are running most of the basic processes on your phones and on your uh, laptops. Then you've got GPUs, graphical processing inter units that are specialized types of chips just for graphics and matrix-based algebra. And one of the reasons that machine learning has taken off is because graphical processing units, which were produced for dedicated gaming units, it became clear that the same type of math that you have to do for high, or the, what, the type of chip you have to produce for high performance gaming is perfectly suited to doing the types of matrix algebra that you need to do for neural networks and other types of machine learning. And that's really why a lot of this stuff has kicked off. And then after that, you start getting into more specialized chip types. So like Google has a tensor processing unit, a TPU, that only inst institutes one type of machine learning algorithm. Well, Microsoft took a different approach. And we use FPGAs, which are reprogrammable, which means that you can actually program the hardware, program the silicon itself to restructure the chip to be as accelerated as you want it to be for any particular type of machine learning task that you want. And what, so we took advantage of that. And we took all of the imagery that we have, over 200 million images for the entire United States, which makes up about 10.5 trillion pixels of data that we had to crunch through. We programmed some uh, set of 800 FPGAs in the Azure cloud. And what we were able to do was to take just a, a machine learning model that was trained on just this one small part of the United States and deploy it across the entire country, a process that had taken 18 months and well over a million dollars to produce the first one, and do that over the entire country in 10 minutes for $42. Which the way things are going is like 100 euros these days. But anyway, but $42 in 10 minutes. That's the kind of transformational change that we're talking about in our ability to get these systems up and running to see Earth and to provide insight into what's happening on the surface of our home. And then what you can do, once you've got that map, you're not just like, well, if you're an academic, you'd just write a paper and you'd publish it as a PDF and you'd say, done, on to the next thing. Uh, if you're a technology-minded academic, you would say, you know what I can do? I can take that model and I can make it available as a web service so that any application can consume it. This is actually software produced by a company called Esri or ESRI. Has anyone heard of Esri? One, all right, two-ish, yeah. So most companies that you work for or will go work for, there's at least one, if not entire teams that use this software. It's around geographic information systems and it's how one of the kind of the market leading software solutions for handling geospatial data. And what I've done here is I've put together um, a screenshot where I'm showing the raw satellite imagery of a location in the United States. So this is looking down from about a year ago. You can see there's this nice little roundabout, a water retention pond, some forest, etc. This is the map, the most recent map that we had in that region. And you can see that since then, this road has drastically changed since this map was made about 10 years ago. It went from a T intersection to a roundabout. And this, I'm not showing you live because I'm, I'm smart enough to not show live technology demos. Um, but as you scroll around the United States now, it's taking the imagery here, it's sending it to our web service, and it's returning the results both in a probabilistic form and as in, in a, a discrete form telling you what you think the results are. So now it's just not a model that an academic trained. It's a model that anybody can take advantage of inside popular software. And so that's just kind of one example. We'll cover lots more in, in our conversation, I'm sure. Um, but you know, for us, for AI for Earth, what we're really focusing on is just growing the number of individuals and organizations all around the world that are taking advantage of our technologies and helping them deploy their solutions on our cloud so that more and more people can, can um, engage, engage with them. 
I think you know it's been just under a year since we launched. We already have well over 150 grantees in our portfolio operating in more than 50 countries around the world and over half of the states in the United States. Uh, within the next couple of years, I would love to see our portfolio grow to include at least one grantee working in every country in the world, principally because environmental challenges manifest themselves differently in space and time. And by having geographic diversity inside your portfolio, you really do understand both the problems that are being faced in multiple ju different jurisdictions, as well as the different ways that technology can be brought to bear to create some, some fairly compelling solutions. So with that, um, we'll probably go, we'll go to Q&A, if that's fine with you. And um, we'll see if I can answer some questions. So I'd like to start with the question, then we'll let's open the, the floor for Q&A. We have the microphone here. Uh, and my question, Lucas, is, is why? Okay, Why is Microsoft, which is basically a company that historically is super focused on shareholder value creation, yep. um, delivered extraordinary returns in the past, um, why does a company that focuses on return on capital, buybacks, uh, mm. quarterly profits, why does a Microsoft engage in this, and what's the ultimate reaction by shareholders and investor relations, if you can share a bit on that front? Yeah, right. sure. I mean, I definitely will, and I often will have long answers, so if I forget to come back to a certain point, just ask me again. I think one thing to look at is that there is a strong correlation. I'm not going to, I, we'll, we'll go into the details of why there might be causation, but there is a strong correlation between companies that deliver outsized return and companies that are progressive on environmental sustainability issues. Um, and you only have to go and look at Microsoft's last earnings report to see that. We're a market leader in the tech sector in, um, in uh, the sustainability space and our earnings report, we continue to set records quarter on quarter on quarter. Um, so, you know, and we'll probably keep coming back to this, this tension between profits and, and, and kind of societal impact and I just don't, I just don't think there's a there there um, and we can talk about why. But um, I think, you know, you hit a few key ones. You said we're focusing on our shareholders. We're focusing on our investors. We're focusing on our customers. Our, so our CEO, Satya Nadella, he runs around and, and basically is just admonishing everybody every minute of every day to be customer obsessed, right? Well, we are. We're obsessed with customers, and we think that that delivers all sorts of things. But what our customers are saying is we want you to do this. What our regulators or what our investors are saying is we want you to do this. Not just we want you to do this, but if you don't act in these sustainability spaces, you don't even pass our initial screening threshold. Right? So there are certain reports that we put out, like the Climate Disclosure Project, where we talk about all of our carbon emissions every year and what we're doing. If we don't submit that for public transparency, there are multiple investment firms that just want nothing to do with us. Right? So we're hearing it over and over and over. We're getting that external pressure. That's not the biggest reason that we're doing it. Uh, we think it's the right thing to do. We care. I mean, we're people. Corporations aren't people, too. But people work at corporations. right? Um, but that's not the biggest reason that we're doing it. The biggest reason that we're doing it is because we're an AI company building the intelligent cloud and the intelligent edge. AI for Earth is talking about some of the biggest data and biggest compute. And so for a company, for an AI company that wants to be the AI platform for the planet, this just makes sense. It's an opportunity space to think about digitizing the natural resource economies, which are the bedrock kind of of all of, of economics around the world. And so you're a global technology company that wants to be the AI platform for the planet, and you're not investing in the natural resource space. You're not investing in making your customers and partners more efficient with how they use their resources, more cost effective. Then you're not doing the best job you possibly can to evangelize the potential and the transform transformative potential of digital journeys that companies can take. I, I, I fully believe that. In the middle. There we go. 
Oh, I love, when did those things get invented? I was at a meeting recently and someone started throwing them around and, yeah. Anyway, startup. Yeah, um, maybe a more specific question towards um, the mapping project you, you were introducing to us. Um, first of all, gra uh, great project. Um, but how are you planning to use the uh, mapping data you actually created? You were saying that uh, environmental changes manifest uh, differently in time mm -hmm. and space all around the world. Mm -hmm. um, are you planning on implementing ma uh, maybe other machine learning algorithms to analyze what happens actually around the, uh, the planet and how it manifests and may uh, maybe to see, to take learn uh, learnings from that and maybe come up with a solution for specific problems? Yeah, and I would say that um, the, the only thing I would say a little di bit differently is it isn't about us. We do this on behalf of people who want us to do it and people who are looking to use that information to, to make change. I think um, it's one of the big defining characteristics of Microsoft's business model, right? And, and you guys are probably being taught now, if, if not, if you came back to business school in 50 years from now, you will be taught about the great battle between the great battle between the business models. Microsoft's business model, which is empowering an ecosystem of customers and partners around the world, or a vertical winner-takes-all strategy. And, um, and so I work at Microsoft, and so we're in the former uh, model. And so we do this on behalf of individuals and organizations that are looking to do this. And so, you know, yes, there's plenty more things that we're out there doing. Like I said, we've got over 150 grantees that we're working with on all sorts of different projects. Um, one outside of the, well, I'll, I'll wait for a second to mention that. I would just say that, um, you know, most of these projects are on behalf of those organizations for their purposes. But Microsoft's also a customer and consumer of some of this stuff ourselves. So for instance, every plane trip that we make, um, there's that additional fee from, from our carbon fee, right? And that gets invested because we can't replace that with renewable energy, right? So you actually have to figure out, now that you went and took that flight, you gotta figure out what can you possibly do uh, to maximize your ability to draw back that carbon dioxide that you emitted. And we do that through um, carbon offset projects, through things like reforestation, afforestation, et cetera, et cetera. So we invest a lot of money in projects that are looking at where we should plant forests, for instance, whether or not our investments are re delivering a carbon return on investment, et cetera, et cetera. So then we look to take these tools and turn them back into the markets that operate and trade in the, in the carbon offset space. And we look to help improve transparency and efficiency in those spaces so that we and everyone else can benefit, right? Um, yeah, I'll leave that there. I love how there's like a little buzz as it's flying through the air. What is the internal price, uh, the, 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 the internal price in your carbon market? What's what the actual you, price? Yes. Yeah, it's about eight and a half at the moment. Uh, and what's, per ton? what's that? Eight, eight dollars and a half per ton. Yeah, exactly. Now you can say that that's low and here's what I would say, which is that we actually participate in the market. That's real dollars. That's the real market that we're participating in. Right? And so as that price goes up, and it has gone up, we follow it. And in fact, we publicly supported um, in um, this year. So if you don't know, midterm elections are happening in the US right now, um, which is interesting. I mean, right now. Uh, so check the news when you leave. Um, but uh, in, the, in the United States, Microsoft publicly supported and energetically supported a national national legislation on putting a price on carbon that was well above that was well above um, current market rates in Washington State, where we're headquartered. Um, we uh, there's a bill called Washington Bill State Initiative 1631 that's looking to put a price on um, a price on carbon. And we publicly supported that. Um, and that is being voted on right now. 
uh, with prices that, that go up significantly uh, beyond $30, uh, well beyond $30 a ton. Um, and so, you know, the, the issue is, is that what most people are doing is they're putting very high prices for a planning purpose, and they're putting those as shadow prices into their business, and they're, and they're accounting for that. Um, we're one of the few that actually writes a check and participates in those markets. And I believe that um, what you need to do is, is respond to the market signals, right? And, uh, and so we are doing what we are doing. May I ask another? Yeah, you can follow. I understand that you have a target for emissions reduction that is quite ambi ambitious. You want to reduce emissions by 70% by 2030, right? 75%, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> with such a low price, it, this, it suggests that uh, given your technology, it does, it does not cost a lot for you to reduce emissions. I mean, I would prefer it didn't cost anything for us to reduce emissions, right? I don't think the... I don't think that something as cheap is bad. It's the outcome that you're trying to achieve, right? Um, and in fact, the more expensive it is, the more difficult it is. I think where emissions reductions come from is both two things, uh, energy reduction and efficiency. So um, PUE and data centers and things like that. And then the procurement of renewable energy, and for Microsoft, that's wind, solar, and hydro. And so, you know, the, the reductions come from increasing your percentage of, um, of renewable that's powering your activities, as well as making those activities driving down or driving up the efficiency, the, the energy use efficiency of, of those activities. So, you know, um, I guess there's kind of two separate questions in there. One is how low does the how high does the price have to be to change behavior? And the other is, how much should it cost to power your activities with, with renewables or to reduce your emissions? That second one, the answer should be, it should be as cheap as possible. I think that because we, how, however it works and whatever the cost structure is in doing that, whether that's efficiency gains or the procurement of renewables. Um, and then the second is what should be kind of a price on carbon. I think those are kind of two separate things because that's only one aspect that, that's only one lever on our emissions reduction strategy. We ask a non-related question. It's the third one. Yeah. Uh, uh, what's your view, your view about the environmental impact of blockchain technologies? Of what? Blockchain technologies. Blockchain technologies? What would you suggest that we should do on that? Well, I think that there's a lot still to there's a lot still to be written about blockchain technologies. I think what's interesting is with many early emerging technologies, if you look at the first crack at it, it was very resource inefficient, right? Um, if you look at a lot of the approaches that um, a lot of environmental nonprofits and small, kind of more green-minded uh, um, blockchain technology companies are taking, is they're trying to get away from that extreme compute-intensive um, compute-intensive method. I think, look, you know, ultimately you can say that from a greenhouse gas emissions perspective, as long as it's entirely renewable energy that's going to power that mining, um, that, that, that um, blockchain mining process, then, you know, kind of what's the problem? I think the bigger question is just if you look at where things are going, it doesn't seem scalable, let's put it that way, uh, just from a pure compute perspective um, and the amount of energy that will ultimately have to go in. I mean, it's just... I, I don't know. I mean, I think that there's incredible benefits from thinking about the world through kind of a blockchain uh, perspective and the way that a, these, a digital ledger will allow you to track assets from birth to death um, and then hopefully immediately be reborn again into, into something else. But I think that, of course, there will, and there already is. I, I'm not the, the expert, so I will probably stop talking about it here in a second. But there already is or are a lot of activities in trying to figure out a way away from the wildly um, 
computationally expensive approach to, to blockchain at, at the moment. But, uh, yeah. Okay. Raise your hand who has a question. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, hi, uh, sir. I had a question regarding the AI bit itself. Now, uh, how do you actually manage the change management in between the AI and the people? And when I mention people, I don't refer to the corporate uh, offices. I mention the people, public people. Mm -hmm. uh, because in a way, Trump getting elected was one of the foundation stories of this and they say the French. I thought you were going to say that was AI. But, uh, <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> yeah. But uh, when we talk about carbon tax, you know, it, it all drilled down to it, and that was basically what he went speaking around. And hmm. the second part of it is how do you actually train an AI to avoid such or to avoid any futuristic horrendous mistakes hmm. to sideline people altogether and just make change? Because hmm. for a machine to come to a conclusion, it should be much easier. So how do you create a... Uh, people engaging change over there? I mean, how do you actually see that? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I was on a panel at the Web Summit, and somebody asked me, you know, can AI replace policymakers, right? Um, and my answer to that is no. I mean, you know, humans create human problems, and humans solve human problems. And what we do is we invent new technologies to help us solve those problems. I've got flat ground and I need a hole. Well, that's my problem. It's not the world's problem. The world doesn't need a hole in the ground. I need a hole in the ground. And now I've got to invent a shovel to dig one, right? And every single step along the way, that's what's happened. People have created a problem for ourselves because of some sort of desire, and then we, or some sort of need, and then we create technologies to help us solve that. Um, there hasn't been an example of, of it going any other way. I don't, I don't necessarily see how this one happens. I think that you know, people that are talking about the singularity, et cetera, et cetera, aren't necessarily as deeply informed as they might be about how the world actually works. Um, so you know, I'm, not, I'm not worried about that. What I am worried about is bias and fairness and uh, equality that's improved, not either made worse, or this is something that we very rarely talk about, but it's probably the most likely outcome without proactive thinking, just maintaining the status quo. There's enough bias and unfairness and inequities in the world <laughs> that, to have algorithms that are assisting people in maintaining them, right? So. Um, and, and you know, environmental sustainability is one. Those, those um, negative impacts of climate change are going to impact uh, those that are the most disadvantaged the most, right? How can we think about changing the way that we allocate natural resources both up, down, and around to ensure that some of those current inequalities are mitigated um, while making sure that, that we don't um, slide back any, any further than we already are. I mean, it's a topic that Microsoft is just incredibly focused on. We have an internal committee um, that spends basically full time of, not full time, because these are many of our senior executives, but across all of our product groups and everything else that tackle these issues head on in a very kind of internal uh, way to think about how we're, gonna, how we're gonna address this, whether that's our facial recognition, you know, services or, or anything else. And, you know, these things are, are a learning process, but, you know, so I think that if you beat people too, if you beat people up too much for making mistakes, you stop people from helping us make progress. But then in many ways, you also have to hold people accountable for once they've made a mistake for being better the next time. And that's, you know, that's what I hope. That's the, that's the simple contract that I hope society holds a technology company to. Okay. Hi. Uh, thank you again for your speech and for your talk. Um, I don't know if you heard about uh, the um, green paradoxon. It's um, the fact that when we are cutting on carbon consumption, we are only affecting the um, demand, but not the supply of uh, fossil Mm -hmm. um, energy, um, mm -hmm. yeah, supplements. 
And therefore, um, I wanted to ask you if AI can um, help uh, companies or uh, humanity to get um, everybody involved uh, but uh, about the carbon um, problem mm -hmm. um, so that the system really works with um, um, emission certificates and carbon certific uh, certificates. Mm. Yeah, sure. For a second there, I thought you were going to ask me about my favorite paradox, which is, <laughs> which is Jevons' paradox. So if, you don't, if you, they don't teach you about Jevons' paradox, it's very similar in, uh, in many ways, uh, simply around the more efficient we become with the use of a resource, the more we use it, and thus we end up actually driving up the consumption of our resources, um, which is definitely true with battery consumption in smartphones, for instance. Um, but... Uh, but yeah, look, I just kind of up a level it a little bit um, and say there's a lot of discussions that we can have around the non-renewable energy space. Uh, there's lots of different things that we can think about, but ultimately, we as a society have just got to start making bigger, better decisions. Uh, there is a role for regulation, for sure. There's a role for market-based incentives, for sure. But there's an incredibly large role for individuals and organizations just to do what needs to be done to minimize the use of fossil fuels and maximize the reduce. I would say minimize the reduce of finite resources and maximize the use of renewable resources, right? It makes good business sense. We do it at Microsoft because it's the right thing to do. I mean, you asked this question, um, but when it comes to renewable energy, it's, it's the right thing to do. It's what the planet needs us to do. It also, by the way, helps us lock in long-term prices and decrease risk and volatility in the electricity market moving forward in a part of our business that's massively growing in consumption with electricity demand. So, so for me, you know, yes, there, there's all sorts of paradoxes. I mean. What, our species is basically an evolutionary walking paradox, right? Um, but, but ultimately, we just have to sit down and ask ourselves as individuals and organizations, what actions do I want to take? And of course, we need, as I said, we need the regulators to lean in. We need the markets to lean in. We need the investors and everybody else to lean in. But I still put a lot of emphasis on, on individuals and organizations standing up and taking ownership of the, of the activities that they complete on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay, um, one other question. You already mentioned the midterm election in the U.S., and I have the feeling right now a lot of countries there, a lot of parties getting more votes who uh, would like to quit climate contracts. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, we have this huge um, companies like Microsoft, Google, um, getting more and more data about environmental issues. And so would you say that in the future, the responsibility and also the impact of those companies on the society and on like saving the planet grows? Uh, good question. I think that we find ourselves in an interesting time um, when society is looking at a particular sector, the private sector, to handle a lot of issues and topics that aren't necessarily topics that should be decided on by, by, um, by the private sector. Uh, because remember, I mean, a large publicly traded company is operating according to some fixed parameters, and there's some wiggle room, right? But I mean, the, the game is set, or the rules are set. Now you go play the game, right? Um, and a lot of the, you know, there's just new rules being added <laughs> to the private sector all the time. You know, I think that's fun and it's exciting, but at some point you got to kind of draw the line of saying like, where are we asking technology companies to make rule, societal rules versus when should governments and others be making that? I think it was an interesting case um, as we were advocating for the Cloud Act in the United States around um, kind of the right to searches and seizures of, of data. And you know, ultimately, where we came down on that was, and, and our president and chief legal officer, Brad Smith, in congressional testimony brought, um, uh, I can't remember, 
some old some old technology. Um, and basically it was like, look, you know, we have our opinions about what the right thing is, but our opinions shouldn't be the rule of the day. Our the our the rule of the day should be the law of the day, and there isn't a law right now, right? And so we're being held between, for instance, in that case, for you know, law enforcement and customers, with no clear legislative guidelines on which way to go. And as a private company, that's not where you want to be, right? Because it's kind of a lose-lose situation there. Um, you want society to speak. You want society to speak through the platforms and mechanisms and the processes that that particular culture has set up. Um, in the US, it's, it's a, you know, kind of a democratically elected system of officials. And then for all of that to kind of spread out and for us to be uh, effective and progressive um, operator within the niche that we, that we operate in. And I just think that you know, um, in many ways, you know, in, in business, you talk about your swim lanes. Right, staying staying in your lane, and I think that uh, I think that in many ways people have been taking the lanes down, and so it's hard to know how to keep swimming kind of kind of straight and and do the right thing. And so um, I do believe that there probably will be increased expectations on corporations to lead in this regard. Whether or not there should be, uh, I think, is a broader societal question. All right, um, first of all, thank you very much for the talk. Um, my question is more regards um, the development of AI in the future. So um, through the revolution or the technological revolution we recognize today, um, we have an um, exponential growth of data we use and data that is created every day. And therefore, it elicits a need for Data where uh, data houses and servers that need to be fueled through hopefully renewable energies. Do you think that um, this will, in the end, create with the exponential growth of data that will be consumed through AI, create another problem that we might not see yet to our um, to the nature of the earth? Um, mm -hmm. Not in the sense only restricted to the consumption of electricity, but any other resources that we might not take into consideration right now? Yeah, I mean, I think you know the the question about blockchain uh, is probably the extreme version of that. Mm -hmm. If you look at, um, sorry, and this might get a little kind of geeky here for a second, but um, <laughs> if you look at the the extreme amount of um, computing requirements that are being put on GPUs, for instance. Right, that that are struggling to keep up, and the only way to get beyond it is to design a specialized chip for that particular task. Well, only those with like the most money and the most kind of uh, requirements will go about doing that, and it'll still be kind of a niche industry. And so, therefore, uh, chips like GPUs are being asked to do things that they're not that well suited to do. And so you see a lot of this stuff. Oh, this you know this image that this company just produced some some synthesis of a of a generalized adversarial network or something like that. It took you know seventy days to to train and evaluate that model, which was X amount of electricity or whatever, right? And you look and you like you start extrapolating that forward, and you're like, well, that's that doesn't scale, right? The amount of resource that we need to build the chips and blah blah blah. Um, but that's not going to continue. That's why I, you know it's one of the reasons that I highlighted things like FPGAs and things like that, which is we need infrastructure that's flexible and multi-use and multi-purpose, but is customizable for any particular use case. And so the pendulum always kind of swings back and forth, right, between bespoke and, and generic and bespoke and generic. And I think that we've swung pretty far towards bespoke. Uh, and now we're going to swing a little bit back towards more generic. But actually, it's not just in this dimension anymore. It's kind of in this dimension, right? Because this dimension is, is um, the ability to customize anything at any particular time. Well, you know, so there's, so anyway. Um, so of course, anytime new technologies come out you have to, that you think are you know, going to be transformative for solving a particular problem set, 
you have got to think forward about what the negative potential ramifications might be. I think that we as a species have been terrible at that, right? We've loved, we love to engineer solutions to today's problems and just create bigger problems down the line. I mean, it keeps engineers in business, right? Which is great. Um, but, uh, but, you know, we've done that for three industrial revolutions. Every industrial revolution that we've gone on or gone through has, from an environmental perspective, borrowed from the future to pay for the present. This is our last chance, right? We have got, that's why I said, you know, actually, I don't know if I did say that or not, but uh, that history is going to judge us by what we do here. We're not going to get a fifth crack at it, right? I just so happen to think that society's woken up enough, the technology's advanced enough, and the situation is critical enough that those three things are going to come together and hopefully get us through. Um, but uh, not hopefully, will get us through. Um, but, but yeah, it's something that has to be thought through carefully. Thanks for the speech. My question is regarding the finance part of those projects. Does Microsoft consider to issue green bonds to uh, finance those type of projects and grow or increase their growth in, in that perspective? Yeah, um, this is an issue that um, I am wildly uh, undereducated on. <laughs> um, so I will limit my answer here. But uh, we have a great program here that you can attend. Yeah, yeah, learn about green bonds and green finance. No, that's fantastic. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah, I know it's probably I'd probably have to take a few remedial courses before I could uh, before I could qualify. Um, but uh, but yeah, it is a it is green bonds are are instruments that we've uh, used in the past. Um, I would need to learn a lot more about what we've actually done uh, through our Treasury Department. Um, so that's kind of all I can say is that, yes, we have thought about it. Yes, we have operated in this space. No, I don't have a lot more sophisticated uh, answer for you at, at this time. I think um, questions like that, though, remind me of how incredibly large and complex a company like Microsoft actually is uh, and kind of how scarily large my role is. Um, because I, I am supposed to know a little bit, and not just a little bit, a lot about everything from questions on, you know, green bond finance to technical details of computing architecture to neural network structure to societal to law. And it's fascinating, and I absolutely love it. And every morning I wake up and just think, I don't know anything. Uh, and, um, and, but, I work at a company that lets me kind of come to work feeling that way and take the time to, to get up to speed. And, you know, to be that person in the company that is looking across all of this, because most companies don't have that. And if you want my kind of big prediction for the future, it's that companies are increasingly going to be looking for multilingual people who are able to speak in the language of all areas of business and stand kind of at the, at the center flagpole of sustainability. I think it's just going to be a wildly increasing and important uh, role inside both large technology companies as many other economic sectors moving forward. Very good. Thank you. So, Lucas, uh, I just want to thank you for having skipped the midterm elections just mm. to be here with us today. Mm. Okay, that's very, very, very kind of you. Um, an inspiring talk. Uh, on important topics, and that's exactly what we want, is to open the minds of our students, so I thank you for that, to things that the business can do for the world, right? And this is a great example of, how, of basically we, what we say our mission is all about uh, leaders with values for the world. And, uh, and it's our deep belief that the best way to solve some of the big global issues is through business, right? And business propositions, and this is a great example of it. Thank you very much for being here with us tonight. Thank yep. you. Thank you. And thank you all for being here as well and for your very good questions. And before we go, we have something to do, right?
Oh boy, selfie? Yes. All right. Okay, perfect. Good. Perfect. Go ahead. Right. Cool. Thank you so much.